Okay, let's talk about New Zealand. Mm. What made you go, I'm doing this. I'm going to walk from the bottom of, how do you pronounce it? Aitiora? Tiaroa. Tiaroa. My God, every Kiwi is about to kill it's me. It's a hard one, yeah. Tiaroa. 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 And then you went to the top and you successfully did it. Why? Yeah, it's a long way, man. Yeah, I guess. How many kilometers? 3,000. Yeah. Total yeah. steps. Jeez. Oh, it was like 70 days of oh, 80, 70 days. 80,000 steps a day. Yeah, 80,000 like so. steps a day. Holy shit. A little. Welcome to the Sevo Show. It is June 1st, 2023. Not many recordings have been uploading over the past month. It's been a busy month, but we're back. We're back in the studio and we are fortunate to have Cam Bostock in with us. He recently went on an expedition and that's an understatement. The man went from the bottom of New Zealand to the top of New Zealand on foot. And you can see this all on Instagram and all that. And the man's the man's a god. And I my feet are just hurting talking about it. But thank you for being here. My pleasure, mate. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So um, we have done uh, an episode before. A while ago. A while ago. Yeah. I think it's maybe well, close to two years now, I reckon. Yeah. Uh, what's changed in the last two years? <sighs> Not much. I'm still hiking a lot. Uh, Clearly. It's just what I do. But um, yeah, doing it full time now, uh, comfortably, which is incredible. Yes. It's been progressing over the last couple of years and just going on crazier and crazier expeditions yep. um, and hikes and that kind of thing. And lucky enough to be able to travel around the world a bit and around Australia a bit more. Um, whereas I think last time we chatted, I was mostly doing stuff here in Western Australia. I would have just come off the Bibberman track, which is the big hike here. Um, but yeah. Kind of reach it out a bit more now. Which is yeah, epic. you were showing people where the um, the rapids were. Where that kind of thing. You were yeah. going to, down to Albany stuff. to to yeah, the yeah. the what's that one again? Um, Bluff Knoll, Bluff Sterling Knoll. Ranges. Yes. Yeah, still yeah. doing all that as well. Yeah. But, but luckily able to like intertwine the local travel tour as well. Yeah. yeah. So you did that, and I remember when we talked, and the the following soon after just went and exploded. I take yeah. no credit at all. But uh, what was the big breakthrough for you for like social media? Yeah, man. Well, you've been, a, you've been an inspiration for me, man. Yes, I can take some just, credit. Yeah. Just the short form content that you've been pushing out, uh, which I've, I've jumped on the last couple of years, yeah. TikTok and Reels. Um, but yeah, just been consistently posting, trying to provide value and inspiration to the people that follow me. And uh, the biggest thing for me is just building a community around what I'm doing. So that's been the journey of the last couple of years. And um, yeah, like you said, it's been a, a steady growth for a couple of years. And in the last year, specifically <clears throat> huge growth, which is I remember incredible. Oh, um, I remember when you hit 20,000 followers on Instagram mm, and I was like, yes. Yeah. And then it was that video. We talked about this off, off camera, the, um, the Google earth thing. Yep. You did that like a couple of times. Did a bunch of the trends. Yeah. yeah. And it started growing and, I've done a few bigger trips over the last six months and just like experimenting with different types of content, uh, more episodic, long, oh, longer term it. content. And it's just been, been crazy. Like, yeah. You know, 50, 100, 200,000 followers on Instagram and, and same on TikTok. So it's been a wild journey, um, but loving every second. And, and the best part is just being a, to inspire and uh, influence people as well through what I'm doing and, and Get people into the outdoors, which is the mission. And that was the forefront the whole time. It always yeah. has been and it has not has changed. Been. Yeah. That's, that's the key. Consistency yeah. and authenticity. 100%, mate. Yeah. Yeah. I've always just, I mean, I just have experienced all the benefits that come with getting into the outdoors, like pushing yourself, um, both mental and physical. And so just trying to share that with the world and get people outside as well has been the goal. And somehow it's worked and <laughs> been successful and I'm reaching people and it's just the best feeling, eh? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. So when you did start to exponentially grow on social media, what was your first kind of like offer? Did you start getting emails shortly after? Yeah. What was yeah. that like? It's, it's a whole new world. I think when you start, you know, that first, um, you know, spurt of growth uh, coming from, you know, thinking maybe I could do this full time at some point. I don't mm -hmm. know how I'd make that work to brands reaching out and offering to send you gear and to pay for you to use their gear and that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's been happening a lot over the last year, which is, it's a weird feeling, but 
something that I've been definitely intentionally working towards. Yeah. And so um, that's been a whole journey in itself, <laughs> the behind the scenes business side of, of creating content and trying to make it financially viable. Um, but I've been lucky enough to work with some of my favorite brands locally and, and nationwide as well um, on the expeditions I'm doing, which is, which is a huge part to help, help make this financially viable because it's not free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did you tackle that first influx of emails and mm. offers? What, what, did you have any like background in how to handle that? No background at all. Um, biggest thing for me was just trying to, to reach out and to talk to people who had done it before. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's some downsides to social media, but there's some big upsides as well. And the collaboration and community you can have is incredible. So I was just reaching out to people who I didn't even know who I knew were, were doing what I wanted to do and, and saying, you know, um, you know, what are you charging for, for this? And, and what, how would I respond to this email? Yeah, I remember that, you asking me too. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure I reached out to you a bunch. Yeah. Um, just trying to, to build my knowledge base and, and um, you know, figure out, you know, what I'm worth, what my value is and how I can bring the most value to the brands that do want to work with me. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, trial, trial and error, a lot of undervaluing myself. I think yeah. every creator goes through that and um, just figuring out what works and, and what what's attractive to a brand as well. Yeah. So did you get uh, management offers or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like uh, social media agencies and management companies and sharks, individuals that try and swoop in, which I've never really dumped out. I think I got some advice uh, from a bunch of people saying that um, if you can do it uh, without that, you know, you can probably learn quicker and also, you know, don't have to give up part of <laughs> yeah. part of what you're kind of, yeah. you know. And you're, you um, can sustain it for longer. Yeah, I think yeah. so. And, and I find, I've found that I've been able to do it pretty successfully without okay. any sort of Amazing. oversight. oversight. Um, yeah, just due to sort of getting some knowledge from other people. What would you do differently knowing through, going through that trial and error had you uh, at the start again? Let's say, let's say you're back at the point of mm. you're about to explode. Yeah. You're about to get these emails. What would you give the advice to yourself be? Definitely the biggest thing would be to just value myself more than I was. How do you measure that? Yeah, it's hard to measure that, I think. Um, but, you know, you're only worth what someone's willing to pay for you and you can only find that out if you're willing to ask, you know, more than maybe you think you're worth. And so, um, you know, at the start I was just like super happy to get sent a $20 product. I was yeah. stoked. But looking back, I'm like, I could have, you know, I was worth a lot more. Yeah. than that, um, which is, yeah, that's something that I'd bring back and, and probably capitalize on more. Um, yeah. You know, not that I'm just trying to rake in the money from every deal. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of value that can come from, you know, getting products and just working with cool brands as well. But, yeah. um, that was definitely huge and something that I am able to help a lot of creators with now who kind of reach out to me and ask, you know, what, should, what am I worth? Well, what's my value? And I've been through every step of that journey uh, up until where I am now. So it's, it's cool to be able to kind of give back a bit as well. All right. Well, let's go through it. Three top tips on an adventurer mm. to know their worth. Go. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's not only about your follower count and not even only about your engagement, but it's about the community of people that you, you kind of, with the people that are in your community because you know, for me, the focus always has been to build relationships with individuals, provide value to individuals, not just the masses. And so, you know, when you have those people that have gotten a lot of value from you that you've responded to their messages and their comments and that kind of thing and, and directly answered their questions, they're more likely to stick around, support everything you do. And um, for me, I mean, for a brand who's looking at your page, that's super valuable having these people that are going to trust what you say, potentially purchase products that you share, that kind of thing um, is huge. So just building those true followers. So you know. community over followers. Yeah, community just over the numbers, I yeah. reckon. You know, real relationships, providing real value uh, to people. For okay, sure. that's the first one. That's the first one. Um, definitely you want to build trust with the audience. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, you would have probably had this experience where a brand that has nothing to do with anything you do offers you a certain amount of money to promote their product. And if you were to push that, uh, the audience would be like, Seb's promoting this or, yeah. or that kind of thing. And for me with my, my, you know, my whole world's in the, uh, my whole content's around the outdoors, you know, I get offers all the time for, you know, I don't know, like a, a skincare product or, you know, something completely random and they, 
offering me the money that, you know, my rate. And I'm like, yeah, but if I was to share this, what kind of trust am I building with my audience? They're yeah. getting all this random information from me. Your skincare product is that bottle biodegradable and yeah, good what's for that the got to do with hiking, which is why I follow you and that kind of thing. Yeah, very. And good. also, there's so many brands out there that are just pushing crap yep. products that are don't just sell out. Yeah. So don't sell out. That's number two. Don't sell out. Yeah. Okay. Build, build trust with your audience. Okay. <laughs> for sure. Number three. That's huge. Um, and number three, I guess if you're a beginner, it's just to, is to actually like do what I did, which is to reach out to people who are doing what you want to do and learn from them because there is a lot to learn and, um, there's definitely value in having a go yourself and making mistakes and learning from that. But if you can reach out to people that are kind of three, four, five, ten steps ahead of you and learn from their mistakes, uh, get advice on your specific situation, it's just going to jumpstart you. Absolutely. For sure. You're going to skip a lot of, a lot of stress yeah. and, and, <laughs> and heartache. I would also add in that if they are, if it's a, a valuable asset that they're going to give you, respect it if they charge you and invest in that education because <clears throat> yeah. investing in your own education Absolutely. through those people to, to get something of value in five minutes, but that five minutes took them five years to do. It's valuable stuff. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Like, I would pay five years of shortcuts in five minutes. Absolutely. Yeah. The, some of the info that people have shared with me is worth money. <laughs> like it's yeah. paid me money. Yeah. So it's like um, looking back, I would have paid paid them whatever they asked for, for yeah. these tips that have kind of slingshotted me ahead of where I would have been without it. I'll send invoices. So <laughs> now that you're here and you're probably still getting quite a few emails um, do you have like a dream brand that you want to collaborate with? Maybe be the ambassador of? There's a lot of big outdoor brands. Yeah, there's some, some you know, international brands like, like North Face, Patagonia, those, those huge brands that do crazy adventurous things um, that, you know, that would be sick. Um, but there's also some brands that I'm working with now that six months ago were those dream brands, which is pretty damn cool. Go on, plug um, them away. They're your brands. Yeah, like I'm doing a bit of stuff with Cedar Summit at the moment, which is a, you know, was started here in Perth. Incredible brand. I've uh, been using their gear for the last few expeditions I've done. Um, doing some stuff with Red Bull this year, which oh, is cool. just crazy. You know, obviously, um, I love hiking, but I'm also really into extreme sports and stuff. And Red yeah. Bull are, you know, the company for, for all that kind of stuff. Marketing kings. So heading over to... Um, yeah, compete in a Red Bull event in Queensland later this year. Oh, wow. What do, you, what do you compete? Like hiking, professional hiking? It's close. It's, it's an adventure race called Defiance. So, yeah, Red Bull are flying me over uh, to compete in this event. It's, it's trail running, mountain biking, kayaking, oh, sick. rafting. Like hardcore triathlon. It's essentially a hardcore triathlon. <laughs> uh, yeah. Instead of swimming, it's kind of like rafting and kayaking down rivers and it's just in the middle of – the forest and into the ocean and onto an island and all kinds of crazy stuff. That sounds stuff. a lot more fun than the traditional triathlon. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's, a lot more risky. That's but what interests me is the the wild adventures rather than just like sitting on a road that's on a cool. bike for multiple hours. So and that, very excited about that. That's it. I mean, Red Bull doesn't really sell energy drinks; it sells adventure. Yeah, they and sell, you're selling adventure yourself. So yeah, it's collaboration a, it's makes a perfect sense. fit. It's a dream. Yeah, so hopefully we can keep doing some cool stuff. Over Absolutely. The next few years. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I remember, okay, let's talk about New Zealand. Mm. What made you go, I'm doing this? I'm going to walk from the bottom of, how do you pronounce it? Aitearoa? Tearoa. Tearoa. My God, every Kiwi is about to kill it's me. It's a hard one, yeah. Tearoa. 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 And then you went to the top and you successfully did it. Why? Yeah, it's a long way, man. Yeah, I guess. How many kilometers? 3,000. Yeah. Total yeah. steps. Jeez. Oh, it was like 70 days of oh, 80, 70 days. 80,000 steps a day. Well, 80,000 like so, steps a day. Holy shit. A lot of walking. Did you yeah. know what you were in for? I was expecting it to be really hard and really beautiful and, and all of the above, but it was, it was harder and Ooh. more beautiful. <laughs> How was it, it more was, harder? The, the terrain over there is just insane. Yeah. And, um, you know, coming from Western Australia where we barely have any mountains, it's just flat. And then diving into New Zealand, South Island, where it's mountains for days and just crazy backcountry, super remote. Um, that was, yeah, that was something I've never done before. So super challenging. Um, 
And yeah, there were sections where you, you know, didn't see a road for five, seven days. And so you're kind of like in the middle of nowhere. The weather can change at any moment. You're thousands of meters up in these alpine regions of, of the remote back country. And it's, um, it's just wild and <laughs> you got to kind of know what you're doing. So how did you prepare yourself for this? Um, yeah, there's a lot of logistics that go into to a through hike. Um, Tiara specifically. Um, so a lot of research, a lot of spreadsheets and that kind of thing in the months leading up to sort of plan out all my food drops because you kind of, yeah, there's, there's sections where you won't have access to food for a long time and so you want to post out food drops to certain locations. Um, so that takes a lot of planning. And post then, out food drops? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... So you just like, what, what, you just rock up and go, hey, I'm, I'm Cam, this package that's been sitting here for a week is mine. 100%. So there's like... What? You know, the outdoor recreation centers or yeah. maybe like a really small town in the mountains and that kind of thing that uh, you can post out food. Or what sort of food, food is this that you can do it with? Like sardine cans and stuff? Yeah, you want stuff that's going to last. You can't put your food yeah. in there and stuff. So lots of canned food. Um, so not canned food. Okay. Canned food's heavy. Yeah, you don't want to carry metal around. True. Yeah, but dehydrated meals is like the go-to hiking meal, uh, hiking food. Mm -hmm. So they're super light. And yeah. Oh, there's a brand deal in there? Yeah, I worked with Worked with a company while I was over there, which was sick, Radix. Yeah, yeah. Radix, plug away, man. Yeah, yeah Radix. Absolutely, they were, Radix. They were amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, posting lollies and usually bars, that kind of thing as well. So yeah, get that energy. Get to up. your food drop and you're all set. But yeah, a lot of planning, man. 3,000 kilometers is a long way. There's countless different trail sections, different conditions, and uh, you're going to kind of have to prepare for everything. What was the longest time you were isolated from any other human life? Yeah, there was a couple of like five day sections um, and I was hiking pretty quick, like hike it, uh, faster than the average hiker. And so those sections usually would probably be like seven or eight days, but because I was kind of powering through um, five days was probably the longest I was between like sort of towns or roads. Yeah. Um, still saw the odd person out in those sections because a lot of people do hike the, the same trail as I was doing. So that was cool. Oh, wow. Had a bit of company out there. Um, cool. Um, but a lot of time by myself as well <laughs> and a lot of sketchy situations. So it was it was intense. But I, I'm the biggest introvert. For me, like being out in the wilderness by myself is a dream. So yeah. I frothed every second. It was and, epic. And you took extra steps because you had to post up your phone mm. to film yourself walking in the distance. Yep. And then come back. And I'm really glad you <laughs> documented that part where you walk back to the camera to take oh, it. Yeah, I made, a decision, oh I made a decision on episode one of my daily vlogs to include me walking back to the camera just as like a, a running joke or something. <laughs> um, and it worked because I got so many comments about it. Oh, man. The and first thing like, I noticed, I was like... <clears throat> okay. Yeah, because usually I'll just I'll get me walking away. And then, you know, you don't really think about the fact that I walked back to the camera to get it. No, and once you you show people that, you they're like, oh my God. Yeah, you oh. end up doing a bunch of extra kilometers depending on how often you do it each day. And so yeah, every episode I'd include like one yeah. clip of me like running back to the camera frantically and picking it up <laughs> and it became a pretty cool like See? little Easter egg for each video. Um, but yeah, yeah, filming the whole thing man, adds, adds a whole other dynamic to a, a hike like this. And when you got to the, the camp at the end of each day, yeah. that was editing time for you? Essentially, yeah. 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 So like filming wasn't too hard because I just did everything on my phone and just whip it out of my pocket when I saw a really cool view. And then occasionally I'd set the camera up um, and walk past it. Um, but because I'm hiking 12 hours a day, you know, and I'm filming maybe 30 clips a day, it's actually not that often and, and it's not too hard to add in. But then the editing side of things was where it was really hard to kind of keep up with daily vlogs. And episode one just blew up on TikTok and Instagram. Oh, I'm in it now. I have to commit to this. Yeah, I was like, I have to <laughs> post every day now. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to miss a day. And so, well, it was better than it not landing. And then you're like, why am I on this walk? Nobody knows I'm doing it. What's yeah, the point? That's right. Don't <laughs> even walk it if people didn't see. My sponsors, they don't get anything out of it. There's yeah, no, no I was very lucky. It went, it went really well. And so, yeah, man, I just get to, get to camp, set up the tent, and I'd yeah. uh, jump into my sleeping bag and. If it was quiet enough, if there wasn't a river nearby, I'd do my voiceovers and um, just edit together on CapCut on my phone. CapCut shout out. And then, so how many change of clothes did you have? Uh, just one. Just none. No, no extra clothes. So one shirt, one pair of shorts, one pair of underwear. Okay. And I'd have some warm stuff to sleep in at night. Okay. But, um, yeah, so you did PJs, okay. <clears throat> yeah, just like some thermal stuff. Yeah, thermal. But I'd walk in the same clothes every day and they were disgusting 
did, like obviously you went into towns and you yep. had a wash day, right? Yes. So every now and then I'd be able to walk into a bigger town and usually stay at like a, a holiday park, caravan park. So I'd set up the tent in a bit more of a civilized location and um, they'd usually have a shower and a washing machine, which I'd take full advantage of. Yes. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I like how you kept the tent vibe because I can imagine you like halfway through the trip, you'd be like, you wake up, you're like, wait, where am I again? Do you feel like disoriented? Yeah, sometimes? for sure. Yeah, for <laughs> you sure. You wake up and you're in a caravan pack. I'm like, oh, cool. I can go to Macca's or something right Legit, now. Legit. <laughs> yeah. hundred um, percent. But the crazy thing about New Zealand is they have these backcountry huts all through the wilderness. Yeah. They actually have thousands of them over the whole country. Wi-Fi, so, charger. They don't usually have that kind of stuff, unfortunately, but they'll have, you know, a long drop toilet, have water tanks and a fully enclosed sort of room uh, with bunks. And a lot of them had mattresses in New Zealand, which is incredible. So Mattresses? <clears throat> yeah. Wow. It's wild. Like we have some huts here in WA yeah. like on the Bibbulmun track, but they're open air, you know, hard bunks, but it was luxury in New Zealand. So a lot of the, a lot of the nights I'd be in huts, which was sick. Mm. Um, and then a lot of nights in the tent as well. How did you keep your phone charged? Yeah, just lugging around battery packs. Yeah. Because um, I had a, a small DSLR with me. I had my phone, my watch, my personal locator beacon, um, a headlamp, a lot of things to charge. Um, and I was using my phone a lot, so I'd you know, drain the battery. Yeah, I was carrying like two big bulky battery packs, which was heavy. <laughs> but, they need um, to, yeah, they need to like invent something for hikers that you can like... Yeah. Get something with your shoes, the more you walk. Yeah, well, there's like solar, um, solar charged ones, but yeah. um, I mean, there was barely any sun when I was in New Zealand. It yeah. rained a lot, so not super useful. Um, but yeah, those two battery packs kind of did the job. And then when I'd get to a town, I'd uh, either charge them at the holiday park or go to yeah. Macca's and charge them <laughs> yes. at one of the ports. Just like, just like a whole <laughs> setup. Yeah. What, um, you, you mentioned sketchy. What was the most sketchiest part and why? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of sketchy trail, um, mostly in the South Island, but throughout the whole track, there's some um, really crazy sections. Um, the weather is also what tends to make the trail sketchy because it's really unpredictable. And I started quite late into the hiking season over there. So um, I started at the end of summer, whereas usually people will start hiking at the beginning. And so it was you know, a lot colder than usual. And I had a couple of days where like blizzards roll in, snow and everything. So there was one day, which is... Um, maybe like three weeks in towards the north of the South Island. There's this national park called Nelson Lakes National Park, widely considered to be like the most beautiful area of Tiaroa. I mean, every hiker I talked to said that was the highlight um, of people coming the other direction. So I always had that to look forward to. But there's one pass that you cross called Waiu Pass, which is notorious for being like the toughest day on the entire trail. A lot of bodies? <sighs> there's been a few bodies. Oh. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a spot where the weather can get crazy. And if it is crazy, like people say, you just stay in the hut and you wait it out kind of thing. Um, but anyway, I got to this hut, which was just before the pass. Arrived there and I uh, kind of got a weather forecast on my satellite uh, GPS device thing. And it was like snow tomorrow. I was like, crap, what timing? I haven't seen snow for like two weeks and there's snow the tomorrow. It's, um, it's about 2,000 meters high, so... Only about like sort of 20 Ks to get over it, but. Oh, it's only 20 Ks, no worries. <coughs> Jesus. Uh, okay. But really technical, really steep kind of mountain. Absolutely stunning. But I made it to this hut, got the forecast, and um, there was another hiker there who had waited out like two days worth of snow. And he was like, I'm going up tomorrow because um, I'm running out of food kind of thing. We're in the middle of nowhere. And I didn't have much food left either because it was sort of towards the end of this section. And so we decided to just go for it uh, the next day and, and hike up. And yeah, woke up in the morning to like a foot of snow on the ground. I, I come from WA, like I've barely ever seen snow. So it was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, we went up and hiked this, hiked this mountain and it was absolutely crazy. Um, <laughs> we couldn't find the trail. And so the whole way up, it was just kind of like scrambling up this rocky mountain face in knee waist deep snow just trying to make our way to this spot. We had like GPS coordinates on our phone. Um, just a wild, wild day. And we, we finally reached the top. Um, took us like five hours to walk like five Ks up this thing. And then like at the top, there was like these crazy blizzards, like windy as probably about negative 20 
degrees, just super cold. Neither of us had snow gear. <laughs> it's just going around was not an option. Going around is not an option. Um, we had the option to turn back and potentially walk a couple of days back the way we came, but that was not an option you, in my mind either. Couldn't let your followers and sponsors down. I couldn't do it. Um, so we <laughs> at least you had that, right? Yeah, yeah, that's did right. He, did he know who you were? Nah, nah, <laughs> nah. But we, um, yeah, that's we cool. ended up becoming good friends oh, there you uh, go. after that, and we walked for about ten days together. Oh, so awesome. it was sick, and we made it over. Um, it was sketchy, but we did it and it was, it was wild. And then, yeah, posting that, the vlog of that day, I got a lot of comments of people saying like how stupid it was to do that. And people die doing that all the time. <laughs> well, you had someone else with you. Do you reckon you would have, you could have done it by yourself? Oh, I think I would have been screwed if I went by myself and I don't think I would have done it. So it was kind of like the fact that we had each other was, gave us a bit of confidence and we're both really experienced hikers. Um, but yeah, we got some wild video because I was trying to <laughs> vlog the day while like in this crazy situation. And I'm glad I did because um, <laughs> it was a pretty epic vlog. But crazy day, man. That's crazy. Yeah, wild, wild day. So that was the hardest it got for you? Yeah, that was that was probably the hardest day, the sketchiest day. There was a lot of hard days. Um, I had a few injuries throughout the trek. And yeah. so like, you know, being in the middle of nowhere with a bung knee or a inflamed tendon sucks, <sighs> painful. So um, how do you get through that? Like, again, this is for the viewers. Yeah. I'm hiking. <clears throat> I have a bung knee or tendons are sore. I'm in the middle of nowhere. Let's say food's running out. Let's go like worst case. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah, that definitely happened to me. Okay. Um, Shit. And you're, I mean, if, if you're in a situation like on a long distance hike, you hopefully have a PLB, a personal locator beacon. And if you're in real bad strife, you pop that and emergency services will come get you. So that's the first point. I'm really stubborn. And so if I can help it, I, I would never, ever pop that. I'll yeah. try and get out myself. And so there's a few yeah. situations where <clears throat> I was in bad shape and I had a few days to walk, smash, <clears throat> smash some ibuprofen, um, strap it up. Like I had a big a tendon issue on my left, uh, left leg at one point. So I just like had my bandages, strapped it up, popped some ibuprofen to keep the swelling down and just hold it up. Jesus. Well, it's tough, man. It can, it can be really dangerous hiking these kind of trails and you got yeah. to kind of take all the precautions going into it. Extra food is always smart having a fully stocked first aid kit, making yeah. sure people know you're out there. The basics, the common sense. How did you get to that point for that injury? Just overuse. I was just walking big days um, and probably ignored ignored the early signs of it coming on. <clears throat> just kept pushing. Do you reckon you could have done the trek quicker had you allocated more rest? Yeah, that's a good question. I think so, yeah. Because I had this, uh, the, the main injury I had on my um, tibialis anterior tendon. Um, I ended up having like a four day rest when Ooh. it got really bad. Mm. And if I had taken two days to rest it a week earlier, I would have never had a problem. So it's a bit of my stubbornness of trying to push through it and thinking, yeah, she'll be right kind of thing. Yeah. Um, if it was a bit smarter, I could have, yeah, definitely yeah. gone quicker with less pain, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you live and you learn. Yeah. I mean, my, my gnarliest hikes <coughs> have been, only about four, five, maybe six hours long. Yeah. In the mountains of Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Um, but the mountains weren't treacherous. It was summer and I was just just doing my thing from my homeland. Yeah. Yep. And I walked, I was like 14 Ks in one afternoon just, just for bands. Yeah, uh, nice. I wanted to get to the waterfall. Um, but yeah, my story is shit compared to the, uh, the New Zealand one. Um, but yeah, like I, I can walk for days. I can walk and walk for days. Going up a, a hill, going up a mountain, I've got some, I've got some skills. Nice. But holy the shit. The long legs would help. Yeah. <laughs> Quads start burning, the calves start, you know, giving you a bit of a stitch up. Yeah. And then the, the night, you like sit down, you lay down, you're like, oh. Mm -hmm. But then you're like so sore. And then the next morning you're like, oh, fuck, I have to do this again. Yeah. Doing that for 90 days with a few rest days in between. Yeah. What was the, uh, we talked about the physical, what was the mental like? You talked about stubbornness. Yeah. How else did that feel? Yeah, mentally really challenging. Actually, probably the most mentally challenging hike I've done. And I've done a lot of hard stuff, but um, it definitely pushed me. Hey, because like I said earlier, it was a lot harder than I expected. Um, I'd come off some big hikes in the months leading up to the trek. So I had a lot of confidence. Like, yeah, I'm really fit at the moment. Like, I'll smash it. Um, and I always have such high expectations of myself. So I like pushing and hiking all day rather than sitting around. 
And um, yeah, there were some tough days where I felt pretty down and pretty like crap, like I'm not hiking as, as far as I wanted to today and this is way harder than I thought and, I, you know, I'm just, you know, there's always thoughts of like, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be like posting a video today and I'm going to let people down if I don't get to where I said I was going to get to and all this kind of <sighs> stuff. So that was, that was hard, man, and I, oh, I had some down days, but yeah. I do pride myself on being pretty resilient mentally and, and I can usually pick myself self up by my bootstraps and kind of to keep, keep on going. Um, but I had to learn to sort of actually rest a little bit when I needed to and be okay with not hitting every goal that I might have set out to, to hit and um, give myself a, a bit of leeway as mm. well, um, especially, you know, keeping up with the, the videos and the, the posting and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> didn't want to stress myself out too much. So I did end up slowing down a bit um, on my sort of intended pace to accommodate all that. Wow. And where do you think you got that mental kind of strength from? Yeah, I, I just really love doing hard things. And for the only, the only reason That's is she said. to just build, <laughs> to build the mental strength, right? So when you do hard stuff and you get through it, the next hard thing you do, you're going to do is going to be a bit easier. And so I, I'm always seeking out a challenge when I'm doing a hike um, I'm not aiming to do it as fast or slow as anyone else does it. I want to do it faster. I want to be a faster than average. I'm always trying to push myself a little bit, even from the first hike I did here in Western Australia on the Bibbulmun track, just, just trying to push myself. Um, and I think I've built up me mental resilience from doing that over and over and over again and intentionally putting myself in really challenging situations. Um, because like, I want to do even crazier stuff in the future. So See, I know that, yeah. You know, if if I want to do the thing that I that I dream of doing in ten years, um, I'm gonna to have to do you know increasingly harder things. Yeah, you got to you got to build up I can, to it, and mm. I can do it, kind of thing. And so that's been yeah. the journey of the last few few years as well. Just doing longer hikes and harder hikes, and and slowly kind of uh, building up that mental resilience because it's it's a mental game just as much as a, it is a physical as well. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you've banked up that experience, and, <laughs> yep. and you're ready for the next step. Um, you're a married man. I am, yeah. How did you convince your wife that this was a good idea? Yeah, it's a, that's always a challenge, especially now that I'm traveling quite a bit more than I used to. Um, but luckily for me, <clears throat> these kind of hikes are, are, are basically a work trip. So um, <sighs> Tax yeah, deductible. All right. It's a tax deductible work <laughs> trip. And um, Can you believe it? I'm like, sorry, babe, I've got to go to work. <laughs> but uh, she's the biggest support for what I do and um, – yeah, Karis actually came over to New Zealand as well for sort of the second half of my hike, which, oh, that which was been incredible. Some awesome post nut clarity for you. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, mate. It was very yes. good. We hadn't seen each other for about a month oh, uh, wow. before she came over, so it was good to um, that that first week after that uh, <clears throat> that hike would have been amazing. You would have ran the whole time. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Yes. That's it. That's good. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, she's incredible, mate. Like uh, <laughs> you know, traveling quite a bit. Yeah. next year and stuff and um, got her full support, which is, which is awesome. necessary. Yeah. So you also conquered Kilimanjaro. Yeah, Kili. Yeah. That on was this year as well, which is crazy. On a scale of, uh, oh, how do I do this? One to New Zealand. How hard was Kilimanjaro? <laughs> One to New Zealand. Kilimanjaro is hard in, a, in quite a different way. Yeah. Um, the altitude is what got me on Kilimanjaro. Mm. It was actually quite easy, like physically. Um, not too technical on the way yeah. up. And because we climbed pretty slowly to try and acclimatize, we weren't doing more than 10 to 15K a day. So pretty, pretty casual. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I got smashed by altitude sickness. Living, what is that like? Yeah, it's brutal, hey. Like uh, living at sea level, living in Perth, um, we're at zero meters elevation, elevation so 100% oxygen. Can't relate. Like, yeah, you're a few meters higher. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Kilimanjaro was just under 6,000 meters and you have about 50% oxygen up that, Jeez. that high. And so yeah, the brain and body just, yeah, they get cooked they get if you're not used to it. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, obviously you want to sort of acclimatize. So we took about, what was it? Seven days to climb up. Um, just taking it real slow and kind of going up 500 or 800 meters a day, just letting the body sort of get used to it. But my body <laughs> didn't really get used to it, hey. So summer day was brutal, absolutely brutal. Yeah, it's full on altitude sickness, um, heavy nausea, crazy migraines, just full body fatigue. I was puking my guts up at the summer. Jeez. Just brutal. Um, 
I don't know how I made it. It was a hard, hard day <laughs> climbing up to the summit. Yeah. Um, but luckily didn't make it. And like our guides kind of rushed me down off the mountain not long after we made it to the summit just for, for safety reasons, get me yeah. down to a safer level. Um, <laughs> but Kelly was incredible, man. Like, yeah, Kelly and New Zealand, two best trips I've ever Kelly done. First half of 2023, it started well. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Went over with a really good group of guys. We had like some epic uh, local Tanzanian porters and guides that let us off. Just had like parties every day at camp and um, oh, cool. such a vibe, such a beautiful mountain, such epic people over there. And um, yeah, despite summer day being miserable, it was probably the most epic day of my life. It was just incredible getting up to the top of Africa, sunrise, epic crew. It was yeah. sick. Bluff, yeah. Bluff Knoll got nothing on it. I love Bluff Knoll, man, but yeah, it's it's such a baby. Yeah. Yeah, it's so sad. Yeah, I, I need to do a Bluff Knoll trip. I, I said this to you um, a few months, probably years ago now. But, yeah. Um, it's one of those things. When's the best time to go for Bluff Knoll? Um, probably summer, but um, oh, you can do it any time of year. You're just probably more likely to get some crappy conditions in winter. Mm. It can snow on Bluff Knoll occasionally. Well, I, I've, I've seen that, yeah. Which is um, unique. Um, I'd rather it be pretty be, cold. Yeah, I'd rather it be not super hot because um, I don't like the hot. But, yeah, I'm keen for the challenge. It'll be Hell fun. Yeah. So you haven't done Bluff before? No, I haven't really done much mm. exploring of the wilderness in uh, my own back backyard right yeah um, there's plenty to do here i've lived in kalgoorlie for a bit i was living near a hole literally yeah um <coughs> going out bush and things and camping and yeah that was was it um i've always loved the outdoors i've always loved uh, the wilderness as well yeah um give me give me a chance to make a fire and i'll do it um, nothing better than a campfire i love that shit and love fishing you know that's mm -hmm. that's where i grew up in you yeah. know and Post -ap apocalyptic world, I'm sorted. <laughs> but having to hike, you know, yeah. a, a country. Mm, yeah, it's I'll not for to, everyone. Not for everyone. Yeah, I have to speak to you or John, uh, <laughs> John Elliott, shout out. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about shoes. Mm. How, what are the best shoes to wear when you're hiking? Yeah, it's a bit of a debate in the hiking world, especially through hiking, yeah. uh, long distance hiking of hiking boots versus trail running shoes. I think it's probably split 50-50 yeah. of people, what people prefer. I'm definitely in the trail runners camp. So don't usually hike in, in big hiking boots like you'd typically see most people hiking. Um, I'd go for trail runners. They're a lot lighter, um, drain water a lot better and dry out a lot quicker, which especially for Tiaroa was huge. There was so many river crossings. So oh dear. the feet were always wet. <clears throat> I had weeks on end that my feet didn't dry oh. <laughs> except at, at, at night when you're at camp you can kind of dry them out and then you put your wet shoes back on in the morning. Oh. Um, it's brutal um, but the, the downside I guess with trail runners is you don't get the support that you would with a hiking boot so if you're prone to rolling your ankles and stuff Ooh. like that mm. trail runners are a no-go uh, most likely um, but <clears throat> yeah I'm, I'm a trail runner I'm a team trail runner for sure <laughs> trail runner okay yeah, okay for sure, yep. i mean i had timberlands but they're definitely not the right choice no um, probably not <laughs> they're good waterproof shoes but definitely not the long hike or trail um mm. trail run the thing with hiking boots you know they're waterproof which is good a lot of the time so like a bit of rain's all good mm. but when you're crossing rivers no matter what you're you're going to get the boot submerged and then once they get wet they're just never going to dry yeah it's, did you it's tough have you ever um like gone across anything on horseback for a long distance horseback no yeah i haven't have you yeah have you kyrgyzstan kyrgyzstan you just travel you via horse hey? yeah yeah like when i went there last year to visit um yeah they gave me this horse and i was like this horse is too small yeah it wasn't a pony but you it was a like, big boy <laughs> I, I needed i needed something twice the size yeah right. i needed more horsepower in this horse jeez i had about 0 0.8 horsepower i needed like 1.2 horsepower it's a joke in there terribly, but I'm glad that I enjoyed it. I follow this one account on Instagram who um, they're currently riding the entirety of Australia, doing a full lap on horseback, which yeah, is pretty a sick. lap of Australia. Yeah. And they're like going through the desert and like yeah. I think they're like in central Australia or something right now. And it's pretty cool to watch. But no, I've never, I've never even been on a horse. I've ridden my bike long distances, <laughs> which... <laughs> yeah. 
you're off the you're off your feet, I guess. Same thing. I mean, I I would probably enjoy a ride more because then you can coast and still cover a long distance. Yeah, you know that's the benefit with, with riding. It's like yeah. a reward. <clears throat> Whereas trail running and hiking, your reward is a sleep. Yeah, you know. The Whereas thing like, is, though, I think with hiking, the the biggest thing is you're going to get to places that you couldn't with a yeah, bike. Yeah, very true. And you definitely couldn't with a car, which is the yeah. biggest draw to me. Like hiking out to some super remote mountain top or waterfall that there's no way you could ride a bike through these rugged, off beaten like off beaten tracks. Yeah. Um, and you're definitely not going to get a car out there. And not many people have actually had the privilege to see it. Yeah, with their own anyone's eyes. ever been there. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty cool feeling to be able to say like, geez, I just got here with my own two legs and carried everything I needed to survive mm. out here. I, I freaking love that, eh? Yeah. Yeah. How many years do you reckon you're away from tackling the big boy, Everest? Everest. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. About a year ago, it? I thought I would never do Everest. It didn't interest me. But yeah. after doing Kilimanjaro, which is, it's one of the seven summits. So the seven, uh, the, the tallest mountain in each continent. Mm. Um, I'm like, damn, maybe I should tick off the other six. Everest <laughs> obviously being the oh, tallest you got in the Asia. Drug. So we'll see. Um, I'm looking at actually going to Nepal this year. Yep. Not to do Everest, but potentially Everest Base Camp and a few of the other smaller but massive mountains. Um, so that might give me a taste. And I think if I'm looking at Everest every day <laughs> on that hike, I'll yep. probably get the, the urge to go climb it at some point. Yeah. yeah. So, to what extent do you want to do Everest in the way that, um, like, you have all of these tours that you spend $100,000 mm. by US and you basically just walk it up while the Sherpa does all the, all the work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's a bit of a misconception, actually. Like, the Sherpas do a lot for you, but you can't just walk up Everest. It's yeah. insane. Like, um, yeah, even if you have a full team, it's going to be one of the hardest things anyone can ever do. Um, but I'm definitely interested in doing a lot more of the work myself. Um, I'd love to be able to get up there carrying most of my own gear and that kind of thing. Um, you feel more of a man. Yeah, I mean, on Kilimanjaro, we had uh, we had Sherpas, we had porters, carried most of our gear up. And I was like, damn, I wish, like, I had, like, looking back, I'm like, I wish I kind of got up there myself and did it. So, um, yeah, Everest would be the last of the seven summits I do, most likely, because it's the the hardest and the biggest. Yeah, it's the Everest of mountain climbing. Yeah, it's the it's the summit of the seven summits, yeah. So, I think in the lead up doing other big ones around the world I'll, I'll try and kind of lean in towards more doing it um with everything on my back and as self-sustaining as possible yeah that's yeah. awesome um have you been to the states never definitely never. like <clears throat> yosemite i mean i didn't do the the trails there because yeah. i was there as a tourist like a basic one um but when i went to yosemite national park oh my god it's a bucket list. I mean, Yosemite is a bucket list for <clears throat> any outdoor lover, I think. Um, yeah, there's a big, big trail, uh, the Pacific Crest Trail over in the US that is like the pinnacle of through hiking, um, which I'm thinking of maybe doing next year. Bears. Um, bears. Bears. That blows my mind that you have to think about bears over there. Because, yeah, it's crazy. Like coming from Australia, we think about snakes when you're out in the trail, spiders maybe. Yeah. And I see them a lot and it's definitely like a danger, but not too bad. And then I went to New Zealand and there's, there's, there's zero wildlife concerns there. There's no snakes, no spiders, certainly no bears. Just like uh, former ruins of the Lord of the Rings set up. Yeah, that's right. Maybe yeah. some Nazgul or something. <laughs> but yeah. uh, it's super safe. And then, yeah, looking at hiking in the US potentially next year and um, having to carry bear spray and bear proof food bags and... I've heard some horror stories. I'm following this one chick who's hiking the Appalachian Trail, which is a, a 4,000 kilometer hike on the east coast of the US at the moment. <clears throat> she posted a photo the other day of her like in one of the camping huts with like a picnic table barricaded against the thing because there was bears roaming the camp and they were just like trying to not let them get into the hut. Yeah. And stuff like that's a, a reality over there. So it'll be a whole new challenge. But um, yeah, Pacific Crest Trail, 4,000 Ks west coast, goes up through California up to Washington. Yeah. Starts on the Mexico. Mexican US border finished on the Canadian US border goals I don't think you have any other hobbies do you 
I love everything outdoors. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mountain bike a lot. I love fishing, camping, but uh, hiking. And I think specifically through hiking is my biggest love at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to be walking a lot over the next few years. Yeah. Yeah. If social media wasn't around, do you reckon you'd be doing it as much? I don't think I'd be doing it as much because I wouldn't be able to do it as a job necessarily. Um, Isn't I'm, that interesting? <clears throat> yeah, it's it's crazy to think about really. And I love I love editing and filming. Like that's another huge thing that I really enjoy, which I think you have to to be a full time creator. Um, but if I wasn't doing that, yeah, it'd be interesting to to see where I'd be and what I'd be doing because I have such a passion for being in the outdoors that I'd have to make a way <laughs> for it to be yeah. my life. I think at, at some point or another. And what about like your general income? Now as a creator, are you able to afford to purchase a house one day or how does that work? Yeah, I think it's just been trending in the right direction the last few years Whereas to where at this point now I'm just super comfortable um, with the income I'm earning. Um, <clears throat> my goal this year or sort of the last 12 months this financial year was to match my old full-time salary that I, that I earned when I was before I was doing this, which I've exceeded now, which is yes. an incredible milestone. And so hopefully, yeah, one day I can um, go from sort of just matching that to really um, exceeding it and potentially yeah. being able to do some crazy stuff, get a house and whatever else. Or a hut. Uh, a hut in the wilderness probably is a bit more <laughs> appealing to me. I um, think for you it would be more of a tiny house. Like a, Have you seen the tiny house? I love houses? the idea of a tiny house or a it's big property. It's such a sustainable yeah, thing. Yeah, oh, That's sure. what my wife and I wanted to do. A homestead kind of thing. Yeah, because yeah, like that'd be sick. if you're going out all the time, <clears throat> when you're at your own base camp, your yep. little home, you don't really need much. Yeah, especially if it's like a little bit isolated and oh. got some natural beauty around it. Yeah. That would be awesome. Where would your most ideal place to plop your uh, tiny house be if you could be anywhere? I mean, there's so many cool places in the world, but... Let's go, let's go <clears> specifically <throat> Western Australia. Western Australia. I mean, even if I had the choice of the world, it would be in Western Australia, oh, I think. Good answer. It'd be in Albany. Yeah, okay. yeah Albany is like my favourite place in the world, so I plan to um, settle down there at some point. Um being in Perth's a bit too convenient at the moment, so stay here for now. But uh, yeah, Albany's incredible, best coastline in the world. It's got all the uh, West Aussie mountains on its doorstep. Oh, I love some, that place some too. Some awesome hiking. The place where you go out to like this this kind of peninsula sort of mountain bit, and you can had we camped there with the van once. Yeah, not supposed to, but we did. And um, you go out to the end, and it's just a whole almost 360 degree view and you can see the, yep. the windmill farms yep. there and Bald the coastline yeah. there. Oh. So beautiful. It's would ridiculous. You, would you be the Bluff Knoll tour guide, <laughs> Cam's tours? Oh, potentially. Yeah. yeah. I do run some um, tours with my Patreon community at the moment. Yeah, which you were I doing love. that. I really love um, hosting group trips. So I could definitely see myself doing more of that. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, what about kids? Are you in the, uh, are we in the, the shooting range yet? Um, not just yet, but definitely on the cards. Yeah. Yep. I definitely want some little adventurers running around at some point. So <laughs> that'll be the best feeling. Yeah. We'll see what happens. I'd love to just like, yeah, travel around the world. Yeah. Get them onto the trails and experience everything, even at a young age. Yeah. Cool. Do, do it all first yourself. Yeah. And then once you've done it, you don't have that sense of having to collect the seven. Yes. And then once it. you have your kids, you're going to be a little bit more reserved, a little bit less yeah. risky because, you know, of course, kids. priorities will change a bit. But then, um, but then you've, you've got all the wisdom and see this here. This is the trail. But let's go this way. Look yes. at this. You open up the bushes and there's a view. And mm -hmm. it's just like the dream. Mate. Old man knows some shit. That's the dream. Yeah. yeah. And then hopefully they can do some epic things on their own as Amazing. well at some point. Amazing. Yeah. Um, what are the other specific goals do you have for um, your social media presence Yeah. quest? Yeah, I just want to keep growing the community, man. Yeah, like after New Zealand, um, you know, a whole bunch of new people from, from around the world uh, jumped on board and followed along and just countless messages of people telling me how much that hike inspired them to get into the outdoors for the first time or yes. try their first overnight hike and that kind of thing. And that's the only reason I'm posting. And so that's it just spurred me on to kind of um, keep growing it. I don't really have a numbered goal. I just want to reach more people. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess um, probably reach more people outside of Australia because that's been my predominant um, follower base for the longest time. So 
Now I've got the Kiwi follower base yeah. after doing New Zealand, maybe the US, North America next year. We'll see. We'll keep expanding and oh, trying to reach keen. as many people as possible. Who inspires you? Oh, there's so many, uh, there's so many cool adventurers that I look up to. There's uh, this one guy called Bo Miles who's over east in Australia and it's probably been my biggest inspiration. He's uh, known as the backyard adventurer. He just makes an adventure out of anything and he creates films and puts them on YouTube. Uh, absolute legend of a bloke. Um, Have you met him? I haven't, no, Ooh. but he's actually coming to Perth for a, a film tour soon. So I'm going to definitely Fanboy. go out and see it and, and hopefully shake his hand because he's an absolute legend, does some sick stuff. Yeah, I love it. Bo Miles. Well, not before long, you'll be doing some stuff with him in collaboration, no oh, doubt. dream. That'd be epic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is there anyone else, dead or alive, that you'd love to have a hike with? Anybody? Oh, to have a hike with? Oh, maybe someone like, um, oh, geez, like someone like Steve Irwin. Oh, great answer. Just the ultimate outdoorsy type. Loves the outdoors, love protecting it. Can you imagine if- Imagine going on a walk oh. with Steve Irwin. Crikey, that'd be sick. And and um, like back before before he passed away, like the, we didn't have the the camera phones. Exactly. Can you imagine him right now? Like, jeez. Yeah, imagine him chucking up a story on Instagram. <laughs> oh my god, he'd be he'd the have, whole he'd have timeline. A couple of followers, I reckon. <laughs> oh mate, he would be killing it. He should be on the five dollar note. Yeah, I mean, his kids, are, his kids are killing it in oh, the yeah. same way, right? Indian Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that'd be sick. Yeah, yeah. They've got some good stories. I think. Uh, I think another one would be, uh, I mean, <laughs> a bit of a cliche, but Bear Grylls would be interesting. Bear Grylls, yeah, what a legend. I grew up watching Man Vs. Yeah. Wild, so yeah. I think he honestly was probably a big reason why I got into the outdoors. Yeah. yeah. So he got me onto piss. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. And he's still doing it. Yeah. Even though he's a bit older now. He's loves doing loves all drinking crazy his own stuff. Piss. Sterile and he likes the taste. Yeah. Into a snake first and then out of the snake. I saw that on one episode. Might have been the Aussie episode. What about the one where he put himself into like the carcass of the... Yeah, oh, I've seen that. Keep it warm. Oh. Yeah, oh, yeah. There's some Amazing. gross stuff, but um, I mean, sometimes that's the reality. <laughs> Imagine the cameraman. The like, what the fuck you want to do now? What am oh. I watching? Yeah, <laughs> you probably I'm got used ten. to it after a while. <laughs> yeah, sixteenth time he drank his own piss. <laughs> yeah, oh, bears don't. Bears You're gonna make again. a montage of this. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Unreal. I think uh, the Kokoda track. Pretty cool. Yeah, following the footsteps of some people before. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. That'd be cool. And what about any specific uh, Asian countries like Vietnam or mm. or the stands, conquer the stands? Yeah, maybe you can give me some recommendations. I'd, I'd love oh, mate, to. Silk, lo <clears throat> Silk Road. Silk Road, yeah. Just I mean, I haven't Silk looked Road. too much into all of that, but yeah. um, I have seen people that have explored the it's Middle beautiful. East and, and, and mm. Asia and there's some crazy, crazy places yeah. that would be pretty sick. I think the thing about that that it really draws me in is that not that many people really go over there and yeah. get into the thick of it, do they? It's not as popular as Europe and North America, right? There's yeah, but all these untouched places um, that would be pretty cool to go experience. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's wild. I think, um, what was the other thing? The Yeah, you have Silk Road and then you have, what about... Um, Long way down, a long way around. Did you ever watch those shows with you and McGregor and that? No, I haven't. There's some good ones. Yeah. So the long way around, um, there was you and McGregor and his best mate. I forget who it was. It was on SBS when I was a young young yeah. kid. And the long way down as well. I think it was from it was was it Canada down to South America? I think. Yeah. Or was it Africa? I don't know. But it was they were on motorbikes and it was cool. Oh yeah, okay. And um, I think I've heard of that. And when I was in Kyrgyzstan <laughs> as well, they they had um, tours that they could do with the the, the dirt bikes. Yeah, because they can kind of go around the terrain pretty yep. pretty well. If there was like a landslide or something, if you're yep. trying to get there with a the car, you're stuffed. Yeah, that's that's as far as you go. So you jump on the dirt bikes and just off-road it. That's, yeah, yeah, that sounds cool. Yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, we went to we went up this one mountain and. We were going all the way to the lakes, like the icicle lakes. Wow. Oh, and uh, I mean, I don't know how high the elevation was, but you you can pick wild mushrooms. They were edible. Yeah. And you wouldn't be tripping on them either. They were yeah. like real, ready to go. Yeah, cool. And weren't any bears, not that I thought saw, but there were like raspberries and strawberries. No way. All wild. Just that like, sounds awesome. Yeah. And how many people have been out there from None. the Western world, right? Not None. many, you, right? You literally don't walk past anyone. Like there's mm. there's this path, this kind of, yeah, there's this road that you go 
down and if you're in the car it's very bumpy like non-stop bumpy you, you just go and this this it is actually uncomfortable after a while yeah right and then super remote and then you get to the end of the road and then all you have is immediately just mountain and then just uh, the pine trees Jeez. you're going to make your way up there you get the if you get the horse it's easier but then when you get to the top and you see that view oh it's all God. worth it yeah, yeah and i did it six months post acl reconstruction so Jeez. there's my kind of difficulty rating there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, one final thing. Um, and thank you for coming on again. My if pleasure, if yeah. you would be able to give anyone advice about life and, and doing what they want to do. Mm. If it's a kid out there who's not sure if they should start, whether it's hiking or whatever it is, what yeah. advice would you give them? I mean, give it a go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had a passion for the outdoors and creating content uh, for ages, right? And I was working full time and it's hard to make time for it. But uh, if it's something that you're super passionate about, you've got to make time and and jump into it. Um, you know, stop procrastinating. <laughs> stop procrastinating starting it, right? There's a million excuses you can make, um, but have a go. Correct. And um, a bit of life advice in general is just go outside. Go outside. Um, even if you're not like the biggest outdoorsy type, um, sitting on your phone all day, sitting inside all day, whether it's behind a desk or on your couch, it's, it's terrible for you. Yeah. So get outside. It's good for your physical health, for your mental health. And it's actually probably going to give you a lot of clarity in the things that you really do care about and want to do. Um, I find that when I'm out in nature with no reception and no screens and a little bit uncomfortable, that's when I have the most clarity about what's really important and, and all these ideas pop into my head about things I really want to do and different directions I want to take. And so, yeah, uh, I encourage everyone to go outside, see your backyard, turn Love the that. phone off and um, just take it all in. Love that. I feel like I want to do a lap of the block now. Yes. Immediately after this. Down to which, the park. Yeah, I will. Um, Cam, how do we follow you on your adventure? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm on all social medias, Cam Bostock, C-A-M-B-O-S-T-O-C-K, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. What else is there? Snapchat. All of the above. I'm not on Snapchat, <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, posting all my adventures all the time. So come join the community. Join his Patreon. He's got some, he's got some peeps there. Yeah. Good, good community. Patreon community. Best community on the internet, I reckon. That's right. There you yeah. go. Good plug. Oh, geez. And, um, yeah, thanks to you for everybody to join in. And if you have any questions, um, you can hit up Cam on his Instagram that's probably flooded with DMs. Anytime. <laughs> anytime. Please do. Please do. Um, there will be a uh, comment, uh, something you can comment in the Spotify uh, version of this audio. Um, there's also a YouTube version. You can comment below if you're watching from there. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. As always, good thanks.